I said, I always believe in Jesus. And he said, you have not or you wouldn't have been doing the things you were doing. You say, how did I get here when I was young, when I was in school, I thought I wanted to be this and do this. And now this is what I've been reduced to. Welcome to Pacific Garden Mission. Sometimes we like to lump the homeless in one grouping and we look at the, the people and just think, what brought them here? Well, they're homeless. But when we speak to them individually, we see the pain. There's a lot of pain that walks through these doors. When you hear their backstories, and it's not only the addiction, you hear of abuse, problems at home with their parents, with their families, brothers and sisters, the stories are riveting. So what has led person, a person to the streets and through the doors of an organization like Pacific Art and Mission? Many times, it's pain. There's a lot of pain. But the good news is we just don't come with the answers of food, shelter, and clothing, which really are only their temporary needs. We want to get to the heart of the issue. And that is only through the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you see men and women walk through these doors absolutely broken and get a hold of the Word of God and, and see Jesus Christ just do a miracle in their lives and all of a sudden put their lives back together, it's absolutely amazing. So I want to invite you to listen to the testimonies, to listen to the message, and open up your heart. And I want to invite you inside Pacific Art Mission so you can see what God is doing. Many people know Pacific Garden Mission as a shelter for the homeless, a place where people come that are homeless and maybe that's all that ever happens to them. They stay homeless forever, but that's not true. Pacific Garden Mission is a place of transformation. Men and women come here every day and sit in our day rooms and hear the gospel message. It changes their hearts and they begin to grow. They join programs here and their lives change. They become disciples and are capable of helping others. Today we're excited to share with you what God is doing here at Pacific Garden Mission. He's changed my life here and he can change your life too. And you're gonna hear two testimonies of men whose lives were changed by Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So be encouraged when you hear our first testimony of James who came here broken and now he serves in the ministry, followed by another pastor. I know you're gonna be encouraged because you're gonna see God in action right here at Pacific Garden Mission. After I graduated high school, I went to college and I went for theater. And my father took his own life my first year out. And I was already kind of in a well, kind of in a rebellious stage, um, and that just kind of sealed the deal. Mm -hmm. um, so from that point on, I was kind of in open rebellion against God and everything I thought he stood for. So I tried to uh, go have an adventurous life, the life that I thought my dad didn't have. And so I ran to the East Coast and did all those things, and I was pretty much just a hedonist and didn't really deny myself any pleasures that I thought were good. And then that turned out to be not so good. And then uh, spiraled down from there and uh, broken relationships, broken hopes, broken dreams. and Ended up, um, well, just a, basically an alcoholic uh, having seizures and on death's door and ended up in Chicago, suicidal, didn't know where I was gonna go and then just stumbled across Pacific Card Mission oh when I was here for, in the day room for I think a little over a week, close to two weeks, something like that until one of the sermons hit home, one of the afternoon sermons and, uh, on September 2nd last year. And then it was next thing I knew I was on the program, like that night. It was all kind of a daze, really. Yeah, I was uh, crying and then a very strong, big security guard was giving me a hug and then I was in uh, Ron Childers' office and then I was signing some paperwork and then I was on a bunk and I was like, what just happened? And. Uh, I was saved, definitely saved then. I knew it, I could feel it, but I had still had no idea what was going on. 
And it probably wasn't until two months later that I actually got my head wrapped around what was going on spiritually. I mean, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, started to think about what it meant, the choice that I made, you know, or the choice that he had made, that we had made, mm -hmm. and what it meant for me and how it looked and how I was gonna apply it in my life and what it required of me. And then I started actually putting effort in a couple months later. And then changes really started happening. Then as I came to realize that this wasn't just a year long thing, that this was the beginning, not just the start of a year, was, that year was the beginning of a lifetime. Once that realization came over me, and you start to take things a lot more seriously because, you know, it's not just, I'll oh, get this done and then move on. This is okay, this is who I'm gonna be. This is a defining part of me now. Um, so, I don't know, it was kind of like a feeling of, okay, let's go, I'm ready, let's get, get this done. And so I felt responsibility, but without pressure. And a lot of the old pressures fell away pressure of like, oh, I'm a drug addict, I'm an alcoholic, I can't be around these things, I can't, I can't, I can't. That fell away. And this responsibility of being Christ-centered and gospel-centered took its place, but it wasn't like crushing pressure like the stay away from alcohol, stay away from drugs kind of pressure. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. So, so now I don't have to live in fear of these things because they don't really matter anymore. They're, they're something I'm conscious of. But I didn't replace an addiction with an overwhelming feeling of fear of that addiction. I replaced it with a feeling of hope through you know, God and my relationship with Jesus. So that's a huge difference. That's like a 180 difference. I've seen a lot of people deal with whatever they might be dealing with, whether it be drugs or alcohol or any, any stronghold that they have. And I've seen them deal with it themselves, and I watch them daily deal with it themselves. Some people do overcome them, but it's not really an overcoming. It's more of a, it's more of a putting it away for a while, you know, putting it in the closet, maybe locking the door, and maybe stacking some stuff in front of the closet, but it's still in there. And the, the feeling I have with my life now is that closet's there, yeah. and there's nothing in it. Well, there is, yeah. but I don't have it blocked off. I haven't forgotten about it. It's there. I realize it's there and I'm dealing with it instead of hiding it. So little by little, that closet's emptying out, you know, little by little, and instead of running from it, I'm facing it, and that makes all the difference in the world. When you walk with addiction, in my experience, or you walk with any kind of hard stronghold, strong stronghold, there's always that fear and that, and that, well, fear is the best way to put it, that it's gonna come out in the light, it's gonna take over, you're gonna lose something because of it. And that takes away from any kind of fun you might have from it or any kind of enjoyment because it's always couched with this darkness. Mm -hmm. And once you can get rid of the darkness and live life without it, it's a truly unique feeling because a person who's living in addiction, they've never felt that before, most likely. Or if they did, I'm sure they miss it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's the, I guess, the definition of a a high, right? It's something that feels good. So, The only thing I would say to people who are struggling with those things is that you don't have to. Right. Because this was one of the hardest things for me to believe was that we can give it to we can give it to Christ. That's why he that's why he came. You know, the propitiation. The, he took the place of all that. And even though you feel like you you might not deserve it. You probably don't. None of us do. Mm -hmm. I mean, but he did it anyway. And so you can give it up to him and you do have someone there. You're not alone. You know, it may not be someone you could, you know, you know, shoot pool with or something like that, but you know, he's still there. And that makes all the difference in the world. It did in my life. It's amazing when we see what God can do in anyone's life once they surrender and trust in Jesus. And James is an example of that because he's in our music ministry, he's a counselor here, he's going to school, he's a fully functioning follower of Christ, 
and we're so grateful that we could share these testimonies with you. And then there's pastors here who preach whose lives were changed by Jesus Christ. And Pastor Bauer is next. He has every morning what we call the Bauer Power Hour, where men and women hear good doctrine and their lives changed because of the Word of God, the living Word. So listen to Pastor Bauer, and I know you'll be encouraged. When I was one year old, my mom and my father bought a bar. And I always said, born and raised in a bar. And I was raised in a church, thought I was a Christian, but believed about Jesus, but I didn't really believe in him. My life made it evident I didn't know him. I was at International Harvester and a friend of mine was trying to tell me, all you got to do is believe in Jesus. And I'd say, I always believed in Jesus, and I did. But it wasn't in him, I believed about him. And I didn't understand that, and he wasn't able to help me. But he did help me one day when he said, Jeff, all you got to do is believe in Jesus. And I said, I always believe in Jesus. And he said, you have not, or you wouldn't have been doing the things you were doing. And I knew he was right. But it wasn't easy for me to understand where I was going wrong. And I didn't have anybody to tell me. I'm in my church. I'm going out. My, my friend at work's trying to tell me how to be saved. I, I just can't grasp it. I, I, I've always believed about Jesus. And I'm out, going out with one, our, our, one of our pastors, telling people about Jesus Christ. He would implement and add, let me say more each time. He was just teaching me how to give the gospel. And then I'd go home and I'd study this book from Evangelism Explosion. And I was reading it after about the sixth week, I think. I said, wow, this doesn't have anything to do with me. I understood. It, it wasn't my righteousness. I was always told, all you got to do is believe. But you got to be baptized and you got to keep the commandments. And now I realized it's free. It's a gift. It totally depends on my accepting it. And I quit working and trying to get myself into heaven by my goodness, and I trusted in the one that was good. And my life has changed. I stayed in that church for five years, and they were having a missions conference, and I went to the the conference, I never missed any church, you know, I went to the conference every day and they were praying for two people to go into the mission field. And I told my wife, I thought it was us. She actually pushed me, you know, and I'm so thankful for her. But we went off to Appalachian Bible College in West Virginia and it's a really, I think still a really good school. And God worked in our lives. My wife and I are began working at the, I started about 18 years ago working at the Pacific Garden Mission and then she started probably seven years ago and, and we're getting to the age where someday we're going to have to quit but we don't want to quit. We love what we're doing. I, my job here at the mission is a counselor. I teach a morning Bible class and counsel with men all day long. I've been doing this for 18 years and I make it easy for people to understand their salvation. I had such a hard time understanding it. Didn't have anybody to explain it to me. But now I, I bring people into my office and I, I tell them what you have to do is trust Christ as your Savior, not trust yourself. And then I use verses like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith? And that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We can't boast. It's a gift of God. He gave it to us. He says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what can I do to make him leave me? No, it's I can't. 
He took up residence in me. I, when I believed, I became a child of God, joined heir with him. He is, in a sense, my brother, and I'm in a permanent relationship with God. I can't lose it because he's the one keeping me. I'm not keeping myself. If it was up to me, I would mess up this minute. I just praise God for how he's allowed me to explain this to people. I was explaining it to a fellow one day. He had three years of Bible college in a church of another persuasion or a college of another persuasion. And he believed he could lose his salvation. And I explained this to him. And he says, you don't know how this makes me feel. I used to, I went to Bible college. I had three years of college. And I would be studying God's word, and I'd say, God, take me now. Because I, I wasn't sitting, I was focused on him. And as soon as I said, oh, no, stop, because my mind went to wander. As soon as I said, take me now, he said, you don't know how wonderful. I, I'm trusting in Christ, Christ alone, not my goodness, his. And it, it was just one of the most beautiful times that, for a pastor to be able to experience with people when they grasp the truth that the work is a work of God. He began it in you, and he's the one that's going to continue in you, and he's going to bring it into fruition when we go to be with him. I believe we're going to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. I hope those testimonies spoke to you. If you're sitting at home right now watching this program and you feel God stirring in your heart, do something right now. Call us for prayer on the phone or come by Pacific Garden Mission and make an appointment. You can make an appointment with a counselor and you can be invited to join our New Day or our New Life programs. They're free and your life will be changed, not by us, but by Jesus Christ, who you placed your trust in, and by the Word of God, which we use as a textbook here. Many people come to Pacific Garden Mission and receive a full transformation in their lives. We want that for you too. And stay with us, because you're gonna hear the gospel message, which is what changes people here at Pacific Garden Mission. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation for those that believe. So stay with us. And if you'd like to come by and you're in the Chicago area, stop by because we have tours here every Saturday. You can tour the facility and meet people in the programs like the testimonies you just heard. I'll be here, Daniel the cameraman will be here, Pastor Phil is here. Come and by and be part of the family. And then you can go to our Unshackled radio drama and you can hear a live testimony recorded at Pacific Garden Mission, followed by a dinner in our cafeteria. And then you can join us for the praise and testimony service, which starts at 6.30 p.m., which is how this program was built around the praise and testimony service, where Pastor Phil preaches a message. And if you'd like to come and volunteer, we'd love to have you. You can start by making beds upstairs or serving a meal in the cafeteria. And then later, if you want to, you can come and pray with people. You can come and meet with women in the day room. The men can meet with the men in the men's day room. And we'd love to have you sit by them and pray with them and ask them what their needs are. You can come and minister to those that need it the most, those who are being called into the kingdom, and you can help. And finally, speaking of helping us, we need your financial support. If you can help us financially, we encourage you to go to our secure website right now. It's easy to do. You can give a one-time gift or you can become a partner with us and give a monthly recurring gift. And I know that when you do, you're gonna enjoy the newsletters we send you. You'll enjoy this program that you help produce and you'll see what God is doing and you'll be rewarded and enriched knowing that you're making a difference. What kind of a difference? One that lasts forever, all eternity. You'll be seeing the folks that you supported through this ministry when you go to heaven and receive your reward. So go to our website right now, won't you please, and give your gift, and may God bless you and keep you as you do. Last week we left off during the triumphal entry, and the picture was a glorious picture of a celebration. As you see Jesus coming into Jerusalem and he's riding on a donkey. The crowds are out there, the adoring crowds are out there, they're shouting Hosanna to the son of David. They're praising God, they're throwing palm trees and they're laying their coats down on the road. It's an absolutely amazing time and in the midst of all this, 
There's our Savior, Jesus Christ, making his way to that eastern gate. And for a moment in the midst of this tremendous celebration during Passover time, Jesus, of course, being the Passover lamb, he stops for a moment. And he does something that is, that is interesting and that would probably baffle those that are watching because this seems to be everything that he was aiming for. The king is here. He is coming. The crowds are around and they're singing his praises. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. When he was come near, he beheld the city. And imagine Jesus for a moment as that donkey stops. He looks over as he's making his way up and he sees the glorious city, the walls of Jerusalem. The glorious temple that was one of the ancient wonders of the world. Oh, the beautiful temple. The, the crowds are around him and they're praising. Imagine this, this, this scene as, as he stops. And what does he, end of verse 41, what does it say that he does? He wept over it. Now, now, now that word in the Greek means to sob or to wail aloud. He, he just didn't sniffle. He didn't, I'm all right, no, no. He wailed, oh. <laughs> he broke down in tears. Again, if you're looking at the scene, you, you can wonder, well, what is going on here? This seems to be a time of celebration as the nation is coming to celebrate Passover and the king is here and he's going into the city and Jesus pauses for a moment and he begins to sob uncontrollable sobs. He just weeps and breaks down. Well, what, what this really tells me, if you want to know about the heart of God, look at Jesus Christ. What does he think about people in their situations? He just breaks down and he sobs. Well, 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 well the question will be, well, why did he sob? And the answer is going to be supplied to us in the text. Verse 42, and this is what he said. If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, this is your day, look at this, it says, which, uh, the things which belong unto thy what? Peace. Peace. I believe he's weeping because he knows what he can do for these people. I'm the one that can bring you peace. I'm that one that can restore your marriage. I'm the one that can set you free. I'm the one that can change your life. I'm the one that can give you meaning. I'm the one, if you're full of anger and bitterness and resentment, that can give you a calmness of your heart. I am the Prince of Peace, and I can give you peace today. I know what I can do for you. And I believe the reason he is weeping as we're going to see is because the vast majority of them didn't want it. They wanted to stay as they were. And again, he says right here, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Look at the end of verse 44. He says here, because thou knewest not the time of what? You didn't know. If, if only you could have known what I was going to do through you and for you in this moment. But it was hid from your eyes. And I believe he just broke down. I think of Luke chapter 13, verse 34, and I'll read it to you. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jesus speaking, which killeth the prophets and Stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often I would have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings. I mean, look at the imagery that he's giving them there. How often I want to, as a hen who gathered her chicks. Did you ever see sometimes in a road you see a, a, a goose and they have all these gooselings. And they're always protecting their gooselings. And Jesus says, I wanted to gather you, O Israel. I wanted to bring you peace. 
I wanted to change your life. I wanted to give you hope. I wanted to give you a pardon. I wanted to bring forgiveness. If you only would have known what I could have done for you. But look what it says at the end of verse 34. And what? Ye would not. The problem wasn't with God. The problem wasn't with my will being Jesus. The problem was with what? The will of the person. One of the unique gifts that God has given humanity is the gift of a free will that we can choose. In the garden we had a choice. Adam had a choice. Choose this tree or don't choose this tree. There is a choice. And sometimes we pray and we say, God, I pray that you would change my life. God, I pray that you would do something through me or for me. God, I pray and we cry out to God. And it's not that God is not willing. It's not that God is unable. It's not that God doesn't desire to. The issue is not with God. The issue is with me. He says, I wanted to gather you, but ye would not. And I think of that word, the day of visitation. I think of, uh, what does that word mean in Luke's gospel? I think of Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. God is visiting his people. Luke 7, 16, and there came fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet has risen up amongst us, and that God hath visited his people. This is thy, your day of visitation. This is the answer to your prayers. This is the hope that the prophets have talked about. This is what the scriptures have been written about. This is your day, O Israel. Yes, I'm coming up on the donkey. Yes, you're throwing palms at me. And yes, you're saying nice words. But I know what's going to happen in a few short days. You're going to be asking for Barabbas and for me to be crucified. Yes, I know what's going to happen. I know what I want to do. But you won't let me. How many of us tonight, and I want you to think about that. God wants to do something so special in our lives. And the problem isn't with God's desire, and I believe it breaks the heart of God. Just look at the person of Jesus Christ because he is sobbing here for what the people refused to let him do to bring that peace. You, you know, when I think of Pacific Garden Mission and I think of those that have come through here, and I rejoice in the lives that have been changed when they realized this was the day of their visitation. You know, Emmett, when you told me today that you were promoted out of the job, and we were sharing before how when you walked through the door, you had that jogging short on, remember? Coming out of jail, having his jogging pants on, not sure in what his future was. But you realized this here was the day of visitation. And now with a wife and a job with CTA and now a new promotion. And you can see what God can do through your life. He can do that through anybody's life. But the difference is you let him. I, I, I think of you know, Pastor McNeil, who many of us know is retiring this month. But what, what I always, when I think of him, I think of when he walked through this door in 1979. I wasn't here, but he came here as a heroin addict dropout. Dropped off by the Department of Human Services. Absolutely nothing. A junkie. And I think as he walks outside of these doors, I think of the story of, of Jacob. Remember when he fled to Laban, he had nothing? Slept on a rock, homeless, went to Laban. And while he was down in Laban, God blessed him, gave him a wife, gave him children. And he came back and had all this flocks and herds and this great abundance. He came there with nothing and he left with everything. And I, and I think the fact that he's retiring, here's a man who came in here as a junkie, heroin addict. Now he's retiring with a house in the suburbs that's paid off. He's retiring now. He has a wife. He has a retirement. All the stuff that is heavy walks out this door, a different man that when he came in, why? Because this was the day of his visitation. This was the day of his visitation. And for some of us, this moment is the moment that you have prayed about. And it's not that God is unwilling. He is willing. He wants to answer your cries and your prayers. The moments of, that you've cried out in darkness. 
and you thought of suicide and you felt the pain in your heart and you said, God, there has to be a better way. God, there has to be an answer. Life has to be more than this. And there is, and he brought you here. And God is willing. But now you have a choice. They had a choice. He said, this is the time of your visitation. But they didn't accept it. I think of what the Bible says again in Luke chapter 13, verse 35. And Jesus speaking again to Jerusalem. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Again, what I wanted to do was gather you as a hen gathers her chicks and put you under my arms. What does that mean? I wanted to protect you. I wanted to provide for you. I wanted to guide you. This is what my desire is and what I wanted to do, but you would not let me do it. So now behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For verily I say unto you that ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. One day the nation will recognize Jesus Christ. Real, real quick, look if you would to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8. I want to fast forward to that time in the yet future. After God brings Israel back to the land, which he did in 1948. After the temple is built, after the Antichrist comes to power, and after Jerusalem once more again is persecuted, Zechariah 12, 8, And that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble amongst them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon, uh, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have what? Now we just read that verse quickly. That verse is amazing. Zechariah, who wrote in about 520 B.C., said, What are they going to do with the son of David? They shall look upon me whom they have what? Pierced. Now, now I want you to think about that for a moment. I, I think of what David wrote in Psalm 22 when he was talking about the crucifixion. He said, For they have pierced my hands and feet. Here's my point. Crucifixion was not a means of execution in the days of Old Testament Israel. It was perfected by Rome. And for those that question, how do you know the Bible is the word of God? You have to explain it. I can explain it because this is a prophecy of God. Amen. He knew when their Messiah was going to come, what they were going to do to him. And in detail, he tells specifically how they were going to do it. They were going to pierce him and he was going to be rejected which is what happened so Zechariah writing in 520 BC says the son of David is going to come and one day they are going to look upon him whom they have what again if you don't believe the Bible is the word of God you explain it to me how a man of 520 BC could write about a means of execution that did not exist yet at this time the only explanation it's of God. But for many of us, we don't want to hear that this is the time of your visitation. There's people, the Pharisees saw the miracles of Jesus. They saw Lazarus risen from the dead. They saw the blind receive their sight. They saw the lepers receive their skin. They had verifiable proof who Jesus Christ was, but they chose not to believe. I can go through the proofs, and we ended last week. You remember the message with the picture on the screen about the eastern gate of Jerusalem that Ezekiel says in chapter 44 will be shut up in the last days, and it's shut up now today. You can get a picture of it. All that is verifiable proof, but it's not proof. We talk about it, but that's not what we want. Many times we choose not to because we are blinded and our heart is hardened to the truth. Friend, tonight as you're sitting here, this is the day of your visitation. You know, this week I was looking and I was... Uh, I was watching Benita. She was walking down the hallway, Sister Benita. 
She was on Channel 7 last week, and I saw her on Channel 7 on that uh, program, Good Day, whatever, Good Day Afternoon, and she was testifying. And, and I remember her testimony, 25 years as a heroin addict. She walked through these doors, and she thought it was over. And I look at her now as a well-respected woman. Now she's on television giving her testimony in the media. I see her grandchildren and her children doting over her and, and seeing the grandma that she's become. I see her going to school and, and being certified as a drug and alcohol counselor. I see all these things because when she walked through these doors, she realized this is the day of visitation. But the reason for weeping it's no different for anybody else in here. It's no different that the same God that changed the lives of others can change your life. It's the day of visitation. Why did Jesus weep? Well, he saw what others couldn't see. He saw, he knew what was going to happen to Jerusalem. I wanted to bring you peace and I know what's going to happen one day. These tears over Jerusalem flowed from his perfect knowledge. I know what's going to happen. They were an index of the heart of love which caused him to weep. Let's look back at the text, Luke chapter 19. So we see the, the weeping of our Savior. But, but, but again, why? Again, look in verse 42, the end of it. But now, thy, but now are they hid from what? So he wanted to bring peace. This was the day of visitation, but they were hid from their eyes. Some of the disciples, Judas was going to betray him. Matter of fact, it was coming soon. The Pharisees were plotting how to kill him. This fickle crowd, many were going to stand against him. So even though they had the truth plainly declared before them, it was hidden they couldn't see. Real quick, I think of 2 Corinthians 4, 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. That if our minds are blinded, it's a spiritual battle. Folks, do you understand tonight that there's a spiritual battle going on? It's not just flesh and blood. It's just not the words from the page that you're hearing. There is a battle going on for your soul. The enemy doesn't want to see you reunited with family. The enemy doesn't want to see you deal with the bitterness and the resentment. The enemy doesn't want you to come and have the peace about what happened in your marriage or some things that have happened in your life. He doesn't want you to be at peace. And that fight and that battle goes on. And many of us were just blinded to the truth. We hear this here. They saw this. They saw the miracles. Jesus wept. Real quick, look at you into Romans chapter 1. When I, think of, when I think of blinding, I think of the, pro, the progression that Romans chapter 1 lists over here. Talks about men and women knowing the truth of God. Look at this down here, if you would, in, in verse, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. For it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who... Hold the truth in unrighteousness. So, so, so the men held the truth. They knew the truth. This group here knew the truth. And there's some of you here tonight, you know the truth. You can say all the things you want, but you know it in the depths of your heart. You know that this is true. But they held the truth in unrighteousness. Look at this. Because that which may be known of God is manifest where? In them. Even before I was saved, I knew there was a God. There's something different with all of us than any other created being. We have a conscience. Even before I was saved, I knew, man, I can't do that. That's wrong. I don't feel right about doing that. Why? Inside of us, there's something going on because we were made in the image of a holy God. Even in our depravity, there was morality. There's things that we would not stoop to because I know inside of me, I don't think a dog goes through that trauma. Man, I don't know that puppy's looking cute over there. I don't know about that. I don't feel right. 
I don't think a cat is going through that. Yeah, man, I don't know. I don't think a turtle has those moral dilemmas. Why us? Because the truth is manifest where? In them. Inside of us, there, there's the truth. Look at this here. It says, For God has shown it unto them, for the invisible things of the world from the creation of the world are clearly seen, that are made even as eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they knew God, they knew who He was, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their what? It always starts where? In the mind. In the mind starts in the mind we have these thoughts you know you don't need that stuff all these thoughts we have whether they're thoughts of addiction or thoughts of relationship whether it's pornography whether it's promiscuity or we have all this vivid imagination we we go to bed with this wild imagination we wake up with this wild imagination and there's where it begins look at this outflow over here it starts in his imagination and their foolish heart was what now their heart and that's really their their mindset now is what darkened it starts with the imagination now it's in their heart and their heart is just darkness that's all they think day and night now look at this here but it doesn't end there professing themselves to be wise they became what Again, there's people that will sit there, I know the Bible, it's full of contradictions. I'm a wise man. Every place has a, a modern scholar, but, but ask them specific questions to show them the problems. Ask them to answer, how can Ezekiel, writing in 520 B.C., talk about a means of execution that did not exist in those days? Ask the, the resident scholar who is telling you Christianity is not true or the Bible is not true. Ask the resident scholar how, why in Psalm 22, David writing in 1000 B.C., so they have pierced my hands and feet where that wasn't a means. Ask the scholar why uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 talks about Israel coming in the land in the last days when they were not there for 2000 thousand years but they're there today in 1948 ask the resident scholar why Ezekiel chapter 44 talks about the walls the east gate of Jerusalem being shut up google it up and you'll see the east gate today is shut up how can Ezekiel know that writing way way hundreds in BC ask the resident scholar professing himself to be wise becomes a fool doesn't know what he's talking about all he's trying to do is hinder you from going forward. Look at this over here. It says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. What man does when he changes his mind, he changes his God. Whatever you worship or give worth to, that's where the word worship comes from. It's worthship. Wherever you give your worth to, that's who your God is. Wherever you run in time of trouble, wherever you flee to in time of desperation. I've heard people before say, you know, what? I, I was so discouraged, I had to go out and just get me a rock. Well, that's your God. You'll stand in the rain for it. You'll sacrifice your family for it. You'll give all your money for it. You'll let some young kid talk crazy to you for it. You'll go out and buy him something for it. He'll talk to you like a dog, but you'll stand there wherever you run to. That's why when David in the Psalms was being persecuted, when David in the Psalms was in trouble, he fled to the Lord his God because he is my rock. He is my strong tower. He is my deliverer. Wherever we flee to in time of trouble, they change their God. In America today, our God is materialism. In America today, our God is sexuality. That's the God, that's the altar that this nation worships at. Money and sex and power. And what happens when we change our imagination and our heart is dark and then we spew all these things and we try to be wise and are really foolish, that all of a sudden now we change our God's. Look at this here, verse 24. Wherefore God also what? Three times in Romans chapter 1 it says God gave them up. You know, listen, that's a scary position to be in. When God gives you up. All of a sudden the things you used to do you don't feel anymore. The things that used to bother you, they don't bother you anymore. 
Some of the behaviors that you were involved in now and you continue to do, I don't feel a thing. At first I would hear the preaching and I would feel a little conviction, and, but now I could hear it and hear it. Man, God gave you up. That's what that says. Look at this. God gave them up through the uncleanliness, through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. It came out in their behavior. They started doing things that they thought they would never do before. Again, I think of what happened here in Jesus' day. John chapter 11, verse 53. Here's the religious Pharisees. From that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Wait, the religious leaders, the ones that would read the scripture in the synagogue and would lead the worship in the temple, the one that the kids would talk to, yes, these people wanted to kill Jesus. And not only that, John 12, 10, and the chief priests, the priests, consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. How did they get there? Because when you give up your God, when your mind is heart is darkened, and you entertain these foolish imaginations, there's nothing that you would not do. All of a sudden you find yourself doing things that you never would have imagined. You never would have told your dearest friend. All of a sudden you find yourself involved in activity. You say, how did I get here? When I was young, when I was in school, I thought I wanted to be this and do this. And now this is what I've been reduced to. This is where I am. That's what happens when the truth is hid and we harden our hearts. And it's not God's fault because Jesus said, I wanted to gather you. I wanted to bring you peace. But you wouldn't listen to me. Back in Luke chapter 19. Back in Luke chapter 19. Again, when I think of the hidden truth, hidden from their eyes what their real needs were. Their real needs were Jesus. Think about this. How many of us, we, we really, we've never, and Bill, I appreciate what you said in your testimony. It really wasn't until you looked in the mirror. Some of us really need to look in the mirror sometimes and just stop all the noise. Look around us. Look at who I am. Look at what I've become. God, is this what I really wanted from my life? And sometimes what we really think we need is not what we really need. We think what we, well, if, if, well, if I just had money, money wouldn't change it. A lot of us have had money before. First of the month just passed here. And I noticed there were some individuals leaving at about midnight because they get stuff on their debit card. The issue isn't money, all right? Well, if I just had a job, it's not just a job. The problem is me. When I come to the conclusion there's something wrong, there's something broken here. I can have a job, I can have money, I can have a nice home, I can have a nice car. The things that I really think I need are not what I need. What I need is a real relationship with the one who created me. I need to know Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin. This is what I need. But it was hidden from them. That's what the text says. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and he began to... Sob. I know what I could do. I know what my power can do in their lives, but they don't want it. And he goes on to say here in verse 43, and this is what's going to happen, the last point. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. That happened in 70 A.D. Jesus prophesied. The temple was thrown down. Not one stone remained on the other. The Jews were scattered for 2,000 years. Listen to what the historian Josephus said. Josephus, a personal witness to the events that happened in 70 A.D., claims that over 1,100,000 people were killed during the initial siege, of which a majority were Jewish. 97,000 were captured and enslaved, and many fled to areas around the Mediterranean. Titus reportedly refused to accept a wreath of victory. Titus was the Roman general who led the siege. He refused to accept a wreath of victory as 
there is no merit in vanquishing people forsaken by their own God. That's what he said. During the siege, there was mass starvation in which cannibalism widely occurred with. It is believed some mothers even devouring their own children. Later, there was even mass crucifixions to the, to the degree that wood eventually became unavailable. Jesus looking and knowing. He saw the mass starvations. He saw the mothers eating their own children to survive. He saw over a million people being killed and slaughtered and murdered. He saw people being crucified so there was no more woodland. I know what's going to happen. And my friend, and as we look out here tonight, this is the day of visitation. God wants to do a miracle in the lives of all of you that are here. Jesus Christ can change you. But I know realistically that's not what's going to happen. There's some in this room and I've seen it. They're going to die of an overdose. They're going to walk out this door. They're going to mock. Some of you have seen him in the day room. Some of you have gone to sleep next to a guy and you woke up and there's a corpse. All this stuff. You don't know what they're putting in the hair on nowadays. You have no idea. Rat poisoning. Putting all this stuff in there. And that's what's going to There's some in this room. Young. You're going to be locked up. There's some in this room, you're going to struggle with addiction. You're going to be in another shelter when you're 60 and 70 wondering... This is the time. This is the moment. This is your day. You need to seize it. This is the time of peace. He wants to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. He wants to put you under his wings. He wants to provide for you. He wants to protect you. He wants to direct you and guide for you. But there's another group that will not. And Jesus' heart was broken. My friend, tonight as we close, how does our God feel the heart of God? It breaks. It weeps. Because he will never refuse one who comes to him. My friend, this is the time of your visitation. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here tonight and you want to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it's not about religion. That group that wanted Jesus crucified, they were religious. They went to synagogue, temple, they read scripture. It doesn't matter what religion you are. What matters is do you need forgiveness? There is a holy God. God is holy and you know he's holy. And a holy God cannot have sin in his presence. So then how can a sinful man get to a holy God? There has to be a mediator or a go-between and that is Jesus Christ. He died to pay the penalty for that sin. And I ask you tonight, all of us have sinned. You know you've sinned. I've sinned. Who's going to pay for your sin? If it's not Jesus, you're going to have to pay yourself. Oh, and I weep. There's coming judgment. Hell is a reality. Eternity, darkness is a reality. But my friend, God wants to offer you a pardon today. If you're here today and say, Pastor, I want to be forgiven. I want to be saved. Would you pray for me? Raise up your hand throughout the auditorium. Raise it up. Say, I want to be forgiven. Hallelujah. Anybody else? This is your time of visitation. This is what you have prayed about. Anybody else? With your hand raised, I want you to pray with me in the quietness of your heart. Pray something simple. Say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And tonight I cry out to you. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I receive you as my Savior. Forgive me, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Well, I pray that you were challenged not only by the testimonies, but also by the message. When I think of that message about Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, that really gives us a, a picture into who God is. It just shows his love for people. God does not delight or glory in judgment or condemnation. He weeps over people. But sometimes people ask, well, how could a God of love then be consistent with a God who there is a hell and there is judgment? How, how can the two be consistent? Well, my friend, love doesn't negate uh, justice. I mean, we wouldn't apply that to our everyday life. If I was robbed outside or my uh, wife was 
jumped on or something like that and I went to a court and somebody said, well, the judge is a judge of love. He's just going to let the offender go. I wouldn't say that's love. I'd say that's, that's injustice. Somebody violated a law. And because somebody violated a law, the law says it must be paid irrespective of love. So though God loves us and he weeps over us and his heart breaks for us, God's justice still says the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. God's justice still says the wages of sin is death. So though God loves us, his laws have been broken, his statutes have been violated, and justice must be demanded. But the amazing part of the story is the same judge that condemns us comes out from behind the bench and says, I am willing to do your time for you. I am willing to pay the penalty for your sin if you would come and trust in me. Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for your sin. And, and that's the point. Since we've all sinned, the wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ died that death on the cross so you and I can be forgiven. So therefore, love and justice meet perfectly together in the cross. There's the judge dying to show his love for me and you. But if you don't come to Jesus Christ, God's justice will be in effect. The wages of sin is death. So the choice is ultimately yours. What are you going to do? Salvation is not about a church. God is not going to weigh your good and bad. So, well, I hope I do enough good so therefore I can get to heaven. No. Again, to use the justice analogy, if I go outside and run through a red light, I don't say, well, I hope the cop, when he comes after he pulls me over, he weighs my good and bad and sees that I've kept more red lights than I've broken. But you say, that doesn't work that way. So my friend, God isn't going to weigh your good and bad when you stand in front of him. I've sinned. The wages of sin is death. That's justice. But the love of God sent the payment himself, and that's Jesus Christ. And if you, this moment, call upon Jesus Christ for salvation, repent of your sin, realize that you believe Jesus Christ died for you, you can be saved. Why don't you do that right now? Why don't you bow your head? Ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. Pray, pray with me if you would. Pray something simple. Say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died for my sins. And today I call upon him for my salvation. Forgive me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you trusted Christ today, we rejoice with you. We'd love to know. If you just enjoy this program, why don't you write us? When we read some of your letters, it encourages us. Let us know what God is doing in your life through this program. God bless you and thank you for watching. Psalm 37, verses 3, 4, and 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. Amen. Amen.